Hey, welcome to Hear God's Word. This is Michael Weinger. In this podcast, we study and dissect the Bible to better understand what it means and is trying to say. We'll cover theology and dig into the original meaning through language and word studies. We'll even discuss scientific and historical ties, but we'll always come back to the basics. There's so many layers to the Bible, and it's all important. So, if you want to hear what God has to say, then let's dive in. Hey everyone. So today, we're going to be talking through Genesis 3, 6 through 7. So just two verses, but this is really the pivotal point of the entire story of what we usually call the fall. And so obviously with a title like that that we've given it, it's obviously going to be quite a serious story that's going to be unfolding. And this is the turning point. So before this, We were talking about the woman. She is in the garden, and we don't know where exactly the man is. It doesn't say exactly yet. It's about to. But we have a serpent in the garden, which is essentially the devil. And so. We have also the scene taking place in the middle of the garden where the knowledge of the tree of good and evil was, which is the place where the only tree in the garden that they couldn't eat from was. So one thing I didn't ask last time was, Why was she over there by that tree anyways? And, you know, was she thinking in her head about it? Or did she have some kind of curiosity about it and just wanted to go check it out a little closer? And we had also talked about how she had added on to words that God had originally said. Maybe God had said not to touch it at some point, but the original thing that God said was not to eat from that tree. So God technically never said they couldn't touch the tree, go near the tree, and so it was perfectly fine. So another point that we didn't discuss is how technically everything in the garden was good. That includes even the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in one sense, you know, we should start asking the question, did they have knowledge of good and evil? Didn't they know the simple fact that eating from the fruit in that tree was bad. Even Eve started out by telling the serpent that they shouldn't eat from that tree. She already had a sense of and a knowledge even of evil. Yet at the same time, I think it's clear that she didn't have a full understanding of what evil was, what it was like, what it felt like. And so This is one aspect that we're going to explore. So now she's conversing essentially with the devil, with the serpent, which we're just going to continue to call him the serpent, as the text says. So after they go back and forth, we have the serpent starting off by kind of twisting God's words. But now the serpent is actually beginning to question God's intentions. So 
this is where we're going to pick it up. So now the pressure is on the woman. Is she going to buy or believe what the serpent is saying? What is she thinking about doing? And what does she think about the fruit? So we're going to read it. So in three verses six through seven, it says, when the woman saw that the tree produced fruit that was good for food, was attractive to the eye, and desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some of it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. So what in the world? We have the woman. The first thing that it says is she saw the tree produce good fruit. So as I mentioned, you know, God made the tree good. So one thing we can conclude is that it was appealing. It was beautiful. It had good looking fruit because it says that it did. I'm sure they might have even been able to smell it. Maybe she even got up close and she even sniffed it because she did conclude that it was good for food, which means that if it's food and not just scenery, then that means that it is edible. So God says not to eat from it. So did God make the actual fruit edible or not? Is it a matter of it's poisonous and God is trying to warn them? Or is it more so like pain on the wall where it's not necessarily deathly harmful in the physical sense, but it's more so because it is something that was instructed not to do for the good of the home itself, for the good of the painter and the one making the home, and the good of the person who was told not to touch things because they end up messing things up for both a and B, as well as themselves getting paint on themselves, which might take a while for them to get off. Obviously, that's not a perfect example. We could think of some other examples of things that actually are much more dangerous. For example, if God said, hey, don't go by this river because it happened to have something like Ebola and there is a very low chance of the people surviving in it since there was not any sort of cure. It would be basically almost imminent death. So the first thing that happened, which is really important and that it's trying to emphasize, is that the woman saw the fruit on the tree as basically good for food and eating, which goes exactly against what God was telling them. Because God, by saying that they shouldn't eat from it, technically it could be okay for eating, but at the same time, it's obviously not good for eating, at least in the practical sense. Whether it is okay in the theoretical sense where they could technically eat it, but then the next layer is that 
she not only thought, hey, this looks good to eat, that takes her into the category of putting herself now one step towards the temptation of eating the fruit because now she's not only just thinking a thought that's contrary, but it seems as if her actual belief system is beginning to change. So she's actually starting to side belief-wise more with the serpent than she is with God by this first thought. It's causing a chain that is leading to a new belief. And so the first thing she believed was what God said, but now that there's been questioning, now she's beginning to think that, well, you know, the fruit always did look good. It does actually look good for food. Hmm. And this is what it says next, is that it was pleasant to the eye. So her eyes saw, and basically the term that it uses is she desired or even another way of translating it if you were to get into like the deeper sense of the word is like greedily desired so she started really wanting this thing for herself and there is other usages of this word such as times where for example in numbers 11 for the story talks about the israelite people in the desert and they were craving or desiring some meat because all they had was this pasty white stuff that they didn't even know what it was, which they called manna. And so they were like, hey, come on, we want something better than this. And so in one sense, obviously, that's a totally understandable complaint that they had. But at the same time, they were always complaining to Moses, even though God was providing them food and getting them through difficult times. If anyone were stranded in a desert and didn't have food in advance, then I'm pretty sure that the chances of them surviving would be close to none, especially back then. But the fact that God helped them, that he took them out of slavery beforehand, like it's easy to forget the context. And, you know, you think about people during the Holocaust, you know, if they were like, man, we have not had steak in such a long time, like we're hiding away in people's homes. And like, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, yeah, like I'm, I'm grateful that they're feeding me bread and keeping me alive, but like, I need a well-cooked meal. Like I, I can't, well, I'm, I'm going to throw a complaint right now. I, I need some kind, I, I need something more. I need a buffet. It's like they were happy just to survive. And the Israelite people in one sense had every right to complain in one sense, but at the same time, they didn't because of the circumstances. So just in the same way, the Israelites were basically over craving and starting to lose focus on the important things that God was doing for them. It caused them to lose some perspective. You could look at a bunch of proverbs which use this word and basically it's most of the time talking about like the desires of a lazy person um, or the cravings of a greedy person. Sometimes it's used in a positive sense for the desires of 
a kind person, such as in Proverbs 19.22. But most of the time, this word is used pretty negatively. So going back to what we were talking about, we have her eyes desiring the fruit. So it's one thing to think a thought and start changing our beliefs, but then when we have confirmation from our eyes and when our eyes see, for example, a beautiful woman like as a man, once the image is in front of a man, it's hard for a man to get that sort of image out of his mind. He has to completely change course right away. Otherwise, he could begin fantasizing about these sorts of things. Or if there is alcohol and someone finds alcohol very appealing and they struggle with drinking too much, if they see even the sight sometimes of even a label of a specific alcohol brand, it triggers them to think about drinking. Just their eyes alone are enough of a propellant to want to go grab that thing that they think and have started to come to believe is good for them to take in. And in this case, it's the fruit that God said not to eat from. So now she is starting to affirm her thoughts and beliefs because she sees and is starting to believe that the fruit is actually good to eat from. And then we have it also go on to say that it was desirable to make them wise. And so now we have another time that it says she's desiring, but this time it actually uses a different word. So she's not just craving, but it uses the word for essentially lusting or coveting, wanting not just something that she thinks or does need, but it goes beyond that. Lusting is wanting something that is not yours and that you shouldn't have, that you shouldn't take, that you don't need, but you really, really can't get your mind off of it and you want it. In fact, the same word that it uses here for the woman desiring the fruit is the same exact word that's used in the Ten Commandments, which most of you have probably heard. You've most likely heard in the Ten Commandments that one of them that God commanded his people not to do is not to covet, not to covet their neighbors or anyone else's stuff, including their home, their possessions, their spouse, the list goes on. And so obviously, if someone is looking at their neighbor and they're like, ooh, I want that guy's wife, you know, she looks good. Maybe I should accidentally do away with the husband so that I can have the wife. This is the story, essentially, of King David. If you guys are familiar, he sees an attractive woman and he essentially makes a conniving plan to put the husband on the front lines so that he dies so that he can have her wife. And then he ends up sleeping with her actually before all of that happens, which 
inspires him to take those extra steps. So he not only wanted something bad, but it led to something even more sick. Basically, he conducted the murder of the lady's husband. And obviously, it just shows how dangerous coveting or wanting something that is not yours can be. So is the woman wanting the fruit from the tree actually lustful and coveting and really actually bad? Or is this another fake and bluff from God and from the scripture writers. So let's keep on reading and see. But I think that anyone reading the story or just knowing the trends of humanity can see where all this is going. So she actually, in the very next, I should say comma, technically it's not sentence, but the next thought that happens is she's lusting so much after this fruit that it says she took it. So she grabbed it and she ate it. That was the one action in the entire world that God had told them not to do. She did the one action she was not meant to. And I think that it's very clear that she knew that this action was not supposed to be done at least prior to talking to the serpent. And so obviously her beliefs have changed so much that she's come to believe the total opposite of what God said, and she's come to align with the serpent. And so one other thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't say is how when she was desiring the tree because it would make her wise. It's interesting that the tree, the fruit itself, wasn't actually the thing that she was lusting after. It's the thing that she was craving and desiring. Her eyes were causing her to want it, but there was something even more and deeper that she wanted. She wanted that wisdom that the serpent was saying she would get. And this is what she really wanted. She really thought that she would come to know more and that she was maybe meant to know more and greater things. The other interesting tie and connection is looking both at the fact that she wants wisdom and the fact that she is coveting. So she's wanting something that's not hers, which is essentially wisdom. And in one sense, isn't she already wise or have that capability? I would say, yeah, she did have the potential. So did the man. And they could have had wisdom and chose not to eat. Wouldn't that have been more wise? Instead, they are after essentially what the serpent seems to have. That is what they're coveting. They're coveting the thing that he said they're missing out on. And that is essentially the main thing that the humans are after. And isn't that true of us? Even when God says, hey, getting drunk is bad. Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I, saw and I'm desiring alcohol and I honestly am after the effects. Like I've been convinced 
And it's something that my eyes are so caught on that I really have come to believe it will actually help me. And so now that she's eaten the fruit, it's the moment of truth. What is she going to attain? Is it godness? Wasn't she already made in God's image though? So like, what's happening? What's about to go on? And this is why I said, this is the tension and the climax of the story or the fall. This is where everything breaks apart because either God breaks apart and we find out he's a liar or the humans break apart because they just ruined the one thing that God told them not to do. And now what is the consequence of eating the fruit? God said that they would surely die. So are they about to die? Well, it says when she ate the fruit that she gave it to her husband, the man. And so now they've both eaten the fruit. Now they're both in it together. They're both either going to attain godship or they're going to die. So what does it say happened next? It says that their eyes were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves. So basically what happened is in one sense, if their eyes were opened then that means they really did attain knowledge because we know that the metaphor of the eyes being open means that we take in information and knowledge and that we comprehend. And not only that, but it's a sign that we understand bigger, deeper, greater things. So are they actually basically attaining godhood and godness you know uh, as some people say are they opening their third eye that they didn't know existed that god was hiding from them well there's no positive effects that end up coming from this it just says that they knew they were naked or they realized and so they sewed fig leaves to hide themselves. So what did it say before when they were naked? That they were naked, they obviously already knew they were. So what more are they knowing about their nakedness? Well, before they weren't ashamed of it. But last time I checked when someone puts on clothes it's because they're ashamed to show their privates so something changed and it doesn't seem like it's for the better maybe it is we're going to kind of leave off on a cliffhanger but let's spend time going into a little more detail of what we were talking about with not only this, but I want to cover back how it went from temptation to giving in to eating from the tree. Because this is going to be a really big theme through the Bible. Temptation is talked about a lot and the concept essentially of a test or trial which is what a temptation is technically the word is not used and technically it doesn't say that the people committed sin but we should at least start bringing up these themes and you know it does leave open especially where we left off the question still of is what they did good 
the highest good? Did they do the best good for themselves that they could have done? Or did they do evil, the worst evil that they could have done? You know, did they take a step towards progressing the human race into greatness and godhood? And was at the very conception of people learning how to take steps towards accomplishing things that would actually help them become knowledgeable? Or did they actually have, you know, a full download of knowledge and information when they did eat the fruit? That's something that we'll go into in a minute. But I want to go back and talk about the temptation as I was talking about. Some of you who know me in person know that I work as a recovery coordinator. So I am working daily with men who struggle with addictions, mainly being alcohol and drugs, as well as even sexual gambling and relationship and codependency issues. And these things are difficult to break out of. And I was I was mentioning earlier, there's a lot of the same steps that we found here in this story that correlate with people who are in addiction. And when I look at the story of the woman in the garden, I basically see addict plastered all over the story just in those very few words. Like, let's take a look at that progression again. So first, we have the fact that she saw the fruit and that it was good. You know, did she originally assume that it was okay to eat? You know, when a kid starts off and they see or hear about alcohol, you know, what are their first thoughts? They're very impressionable. Maybe their their first experience was something like hearing their dad say, hey, you know, drinking alcohol isn't good for you. Getting drunk, you know, it's dangerous. But then they see their uncle getting wasted and he comes over to the house and they see him getting drunk. Like, obviously, there's conflictory messages there. So the woman, you know, she was, along with the man who was with her, getting conflictory messages. You know, she knew and heard that it wasn't good. She got that from an authority greater than herself. But at the same time, she's seeing some contrary evidence. like. Like her uncle, who seems to be enjoying himself and having a good time, and nothing bad seems to be happening to him. He just acts a little silly, you know. Um, you know, a couple weird and bad things have happened to him, but you know, like obviously, it seems like he's okay. Slowly, the kids' knowledge is growing. They're having more experiences of good and evil, and they're taking in all of this input. They don't necessarily know how to process it. And so, in a way, this is what we call childhood trauma a lot of times. And it's causing the child to not really know how to process life and to make good decisions. And so, you know, the man and the woman, they didn't necessarily have any sort of trauma because they didn't have time to. So we see the first step of beginning to fall into something unbeneficial, not good, and harmful for us, falling into some kind of addiction, falling into 
something that is going to lead to consequences that it all starts with some input that we see having conflictory experiences that start getting us to feel different ways than originally we should have like it would have been perfect if the child didn't see their uncle and never had this negative sort of experience but it's just a fact that we all have conflictory worldviews that are eating at our attention and people are not always necessarily trying to be a bad example for us you know sometimes there's a loving parent who's trying to do their best but they're caught up in bad ways and lifestyles and maybe they even think that they're great and that they're doing a good job but Later, they find out that their kids had a bunch of things against them that they were completely blind to about themselves. And this is crazy about all of us, that we all have a pull towards things that we've heard about from religious places or we've heard from God that this or that isn't good, but we've actually gotten entangled in that kind of stuff. We've spent time thinking about bad thoughts, considering bad thoughts, looking at things that are not good and beneficial. That's the next step. You know, once you see the fruit, then you start to want it and crave it. And anyone who knows addictions know that cravings is synonymous with wanting whatever that addictive thing is. And so the difficult thing is, like I was talking about earlier, once you see, for example, even the name of someone who hurt you in the past, you could just see their name in a newspaper and remember that they did something to hurt you a long time ago, you will flare up with rage for that person. Or like I was saying, you know, if someone you knew back from high school re-entered your life and you were attracted to them, there's going to be an instant flare-up that happens. Or, for example, if we take something that's prohibited, you know, let's just say cocaine or something of that sort, even though you know that it's not good for you, you know that it's against the law, you know that God doesn't want you doing it, your family doesn't want you doing it. Maybe you don't even want to do it yourself. Like when you see it and you know what the benefits of getting high can do to your emotional and strugglesome situation, sometimes it's a very appealing and very powerful sort of solution in your mind. And obviously it's not a solution, but neither was eating the fruit from the tree. There is this desire that builds up and, you know, it's for that actual object At first, you see that object or you see something associated with it. You see the tree, you see the fruit, and then you start wanting it. And then that moves to not only just craving and desiring it, but you 
cannot take your eyes off of it. You're thinking and now planning ways to get that thing. And this is where it becomes very dangerous. Like step one is the best place to turn around and to surrender and say, hey, God, or call a friend. Hey, bud, you know, I I need some help. I am struggling with some pretty perverted thoughts. Uh, I need help out of this right now because, you know, if if I don't get my mind off this thing, I'm going down. And I've seen time after time people who were just living life like it was all good. They were free or seemed free from the troubles of life. And then something that was calling their name that was bad for them ended up drawing their attention and they started to look at it and they kept looking at it and they kept thinking about it. And then they started desiring it and they let themselves keep desiring it. And then they started wanting it so bad and lusting, which essentially means hyper focusing, like focusing on something so much that you can't get your mind off of it, that causes your heart rate to start to increase, causes your thought process and your logic to basically be overridden by what's called your limbic system, which is your fight or flight mode. So now your body is getting pumped up like, I want this thing. And when your heart is racing, you're not thinking as clearly because it's a matter now of life or death. And literally, eating from the tree was a matter of life and death. I'm sure that the woman's heart was racing. And this is essentially, even though it is not labeled as a story of addiction, like I said, I see the process of lust and addiction written all over this. And the woman wanted not only the actual thing, but the effect of the thing. She wanted the outcome of the thing, basically to become wise. Like she wanted whatever the serpent had, whatever the serpent knew that God wasn't letting her, you know, um, like whatever I can't get in this world, like I can't make my own happiness. Like I, I need that drug to give me that feeling that I can't get anywhere else. Like, maybe you think you can't get it anywhere else, but we all know that the drug, we all know that this fruit, which was a drug, was poison to the people and that it was a lie. And then the last step is giving in and committing the evil act. So the misstep from eating from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, many people call it sin, but the story is talking in black and white right now. And there's good and evil. And there's the choice to even do good or evil, good or bad. It would probably be better to phrase it that way right now. Because when we think of all the different aspects of what's going on, you know, we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we also have, you know, questions 
is God good or is God bad? Is the serpent good or is the serpent bad? Was eating the fruit that the humans did good or bad? Like this tree is exposing who everyone is. So the question is, is God bad and the people and the serpent good or are the people kind of like a innocent bystander that were just deceived? Like, are they going to be at least a little bit let off the hook by God because he feels bad that they were tricked? Like, what's going to happen after this? Like, is God not even capable of enforcing the fact that he was dire? Is he going to change his mind? Is he going to feel bad and be like, man, Oh, man, I I made these people. I didn't think they would do it. I love them. Or did he know that they were going to mess it up? And in which case, why would he make it? And, you know, would that make him good or bad? You know, there's all these questions that are hanging in the balance. So now tying the conversation of lust and making bad decisions because of desires for things that are not good, we can tie this into what happens because we all know when we do bad things that there is consequences. So it says that when they ate from the tree, well, one good thing happened. The serpent was right. Their eyes were open. They did come to know some things. So one thing we can say is the serpent was actually being truthful, at least about some things we have just learned. And yet, even though they have their eyes opened, you know, the question is like, what kind of things were endowed and downloaded and inputted into their minds what kinds of things did they learn and it seems to me like not all of it was good because it says that they sewed fig leaves because they were naked so before we were talking about they were unashamed but now it seems as if they are ashamed so did something go wrong like was not all it was cracked up to be and if it was like where are the other benefits like are we about to find out that there are more benefits to come or are we going to find out that there's more curses and like bad things and like death that's about to come we're going to find out about these things but i wanted to spend just another minute talking about the nakedness and I'm going to leave a link in the notes below, but there is a good link from Ligonier and it's a good resource on the biblical connection from different stories in scripture about nakedness. And basically Almost every time nakedness is mentioned, except for before this event that just occurred, that was the only time that it was positive throughout most of the rest of the stories. For example, you have the story of Noah that comes a little bit down the road, not too far, which were going to get to when we get several chapters in to Genesis and essentially after he survives the flood he ends up getting drunk and naked and he ends up cursing his son's son's family line so obviously nakedness was not a good thing there Uh, We also have other stories, like even in the gospel, which is the accounts about Jesus 
and there's a guy who is naked and runs off ashamed. And so there's several stories about nakedness, but it's not a good thing. I mean, when we think about it in our culture, when you think of being naked, you know, usually you think about being exposed and you think about revealing things that are very private and that are inappropriate to let out to other people. And so, like, is there something wrong that clicked with their mind? Like, were they the people meant to be naked at the beginning and God was kind of just playing a goofy joke with them? You know, like, oh, I wonder if I can you know, create the people naked and have them not notice that it's a weird thing? Or, like, is there actually something that's, like, naturally not wrong, but something that shifted in the mindset of people? Like, what caused them to start becoming ashamed of that to the point where they had to cover up? And, like, maybe there were other people and, like, they were comfortable around themselves, but there had become other people on the earth and that were around them. So they thought it was proper to cover themselves up. Maybe people were starting to become perverted or having weird thoughts such as perverted ones. You know, I've heard the theory before that what the opening of the eyes was, was people becoming aware and having sex with each other for the first time, and that's when their eyes were open, that the fruit was the act of sex. But it's clear that God did not prohibit the eating of fruit if his very first command was be fruitful and multiply to them. So that immediately disengages that situation from being the case. So there's something different going on. And I've heard a bunch of theories about what people have to say, but it's clear that there was either an actual tree and fruit that God didn't want them to eat from, or there was some other thing at the beginning that God didn't want them to do. And in Chinese, actually, there's a term, jieguo, which it literally means finished fruit. And when you have a plant that fully grows and matures and produces fruit, Essentially, the meaning of the word is result. And the interesting tie-in, it was actually used several times in Genesis chapter 1 in the Chinese version to talk about how when God made the light and when God made this and when God made that, it was. So whether this was an actual tree or was something else that was symbolizing the decision that the first man and woman had to make and when they chose to disobey and do bad and choose bad, the thing that we can take away is that, like we were talking about, the process of desire and the power that that has, the power that even if we can gain some good things from gaining knowledge, in the end, it leaves us always wanting more. Take drugs again, for example. You know, they ate from this fruit, yet. They seemed unsatisfied with the results because immediately they did not have bliss. 
they didn't attain a higher consciousness. If anything, it seems that they became ashamed. And why is that? I think it's clear that when we do things that are bad, that we were told not to, and then we don't get the full result of what we want or we thought we would have gotten, that we become disappointed. It's like, yeah, you do gain that high. And obviously, they gained the high of opening their eyes. But it wasn't everything seemingly that it was cracked up to be. And disobeying God never is. And I believe if there's one thing that we can take away from the fall, it's that this is the struggle of every person, the struggle to constantly fall into bad and evil and sinful things that are not good for us. And God does not want to see us get in this pattern of shame. And we'll also talk about guiltiness because we're about to come around to consequences in the next part. And obviously, shame seems to be a pretty big theme that's going on. First, it was not being ashamed, and now it is starting to move towards shame because of a shameful action. With that, I'll leave you guys with my own personal last thoughts, and that's that the gaining of the knowledge of good and evil was the understanding and the experience and even a greater knowledge of what is and what can be good and evil. And I believe when they understood, learned, and gained knowledge and realized basically the gap and the depravity and the craziness of the difference between good and evil and the fact that they would have so much more knowledge and actions to do to fully gain goodness, I think that they realized how shameful what they did was. I think they realized that they did not make a good choice because in the very next part, we're going to pick up on God visiting them and checking in on them in the garden. And I think you all kind of are getting the picture that it's not going to be a pleasant conversation. And so the last thing I want to leave you guys with is a lesson that we can actually learn and apply because even though it doesn't say what we're supposed to take out of it, it's pretty clear what is happening and what we're supposed to take out of it. And that is that just as the woman was deceived and tricked into her desires, the things that she saw and thought were good, and I'm as guilty as anyone about these things, that it's not all it's cracked up to be. God would prefer them to have listened to him because even though we haven't gotten into the theme about obeying or doing what is right and good, at the same time, we are starting to learn just through story how this concept is a reality. And so the challenge is next time you're facing something that you know is bad, that God has said not to do, try listening to his instructions. And it may not be as exciting or pleasant in the moment, 
but we all know that doing the good or right thing in the end is a much better payoff and we don't have to pay the consequences later on down the road. Hey, I'm so glad you guys could join for today's podcast. I hope things clicked for you and that you're able to better understand God's word. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So keep on listening to what God has to say, and I'll see you guys next time. God bless.